1968, the People's Republic of China suddenly developed a frantic obsession for mangoes. In July of that year, virtually no one in China had ever heard of mangoes, let alone seen one. A mere month later, mangoes became a divine symbol that was worshipped on altars by the entire republic. People lined up for hours just to catch a glimpse of the divine fruit. They bought wax and plastic facsimiles to proudly display in their homes. They ate and drank from mango-decorated plates and mugs. They smoked mango-flavored cigarettes, washed with mango-scented soaps, and even slept on mango-printed bedsheets. And it all began with a single crate of mangoes from Pakistan. Mao's Cultural Revolution was well underway. The boots on the ground push for this revolution was spearheaded by the Red Guards, a radical student movement that was sanctioned by Mao himself to use any means necessary to spread his revolutionary ideology. While united in their everlasting loyalty to Mao, the movement suffered from infighting and factionalism which culminated in a conflict between two competing factions in the campus of Tsinghua University. One faction proclaimed itself to be the true defender of Mao's theory and accused the other of being made up of treacherous rebels. The other faction retorted, no, you. Violence ensued. Thousands of students vacated the university to avoid the chaos, leaving only the Red Guard, around 400 of them, who armed themselves with rifles and DIY grenades made in the university laboratories and proceeded to engage in all-out warfare against one another for several months. After numerous calls to quell violence fell on deaf ears, Mao addressed the conflict by urging workers from six of his personally directed factories to travel to the university and occupy the campus. The workers decided that a peaceful approach would yield the highest chance of success. So, on the 27th of July, they arrived at the university campus 30,000 strong, not armed with any weapons, but instead, and this is a direct quote, perhaps the greatest quote of all time, armed with an inexhaustible source of strength and a spiritual atom bomb of infinite power. It might not surprise you to hear that the spiritual atom bomb of infinite power was rather useless in the hand-to-hand -hand combat that quickly followed. At least five workers were killed in the skirmish. About 730 were seriously injured and 143 were taken prisoner by the Red Guard. The very next day, having had enough, Mao assembled delegates from both factions and successfully negotiated a truce. Most of the workers returned to their factories, while some remained on campus to preside over the fragile peace. A week later, on the 4th of August, the Pakistani Prime Minister arrived with his wife to China on a diplomatic visit, bearing a small present for Mao. A crate of a few dozen mangoes. The next day, Mao wrote a letter declaring that the revolution will no longer be led by the Red Guard, but instead by the workers. He then instructed one of his bodyguards to deliver the letter and the crate of mangoes to the workers still on campus as a gift. No one could have expected what happened next. As soon as the gift of mangoes arrived, the workers were incredibly energized and deeply moved. Reportedly, they stayed up all night observing, touching, and smelling this never-before-seen fruit as they discussed the implications of the declaration and contemplated Mao's generosity. As previously mentioned, most of the workers had already left the campus and returned to their factories. So, a fresh mango was sent to each factory where they were received with almost religious reverence. Dr. Li Jitsui, Mao's personal physician, described the event as follows. The workers of the factory held a huge ceremony rich in the recitation of Mao's words to welcome the arrival of the mango. They covered the fruit in formaldehyde and sealed it in a glass vitrine, hoping to preserve it for posterity, and placed it on an altar in the factory auditorium where workers lined up to file past it, solemnly bowing as they walked by. In another factory, the mango was covered with wax, but no one had thought to sterilize it beforehand, so after a few days on display, when it began to show signs of rot, the revolutionary committee of the factory decided to boil the mango in a huge pot of water and hold a second, equally solemn ceremony. 
Mao again was greatly venerated and the gift of the mango was lauded as evidence of the chairman's deep concern for the workers. Then everyone in the factory filed by and each worker drank a spoonful of the water in which the sacred mango had been boiled. After that, a wax facsimile of the mango was created to replace the original on the altar. A few days later, the gift of the mango was announced in the state-run People's Daily, and for several weeks, the newspaper published articles and poems of praise and adulation for Mao's gifts. I shall now read to you an excerpt from one of these poems. Seeing that golden mango was as if seeing the great leader Chairman Mao. Standing before that golden mango was just like standing beside Chairman Mao. Again and again touching that golden mango, that golden mango was so warm. Again and again sniffing the mango, that golden mango was so fragrant. Poetry doesn't translate well. While the initial enthusiasm for the mangoes was spontaneous, the National Day Parade on the 1st of October was meticulously calculated to capitalize on the mass mania. Several floats in the parade featured massive baskets of mangoes surrounded by marching groups carrying flowers and banners which celebrated Mao's generosity and his decision to bestow the leadership of the revolution on the workers. Propaganda teams then embarked on spreading the news to all corners of the republic by taking the mangoes on the road. Real and facsimile mangoes were transported from city to city, where countless citizens eagerly waited with the sound of drums and cymbals in the background just to catch a short glimpse of the magical fruit. On one such occasion, in a rural part of Sichuan province, one man was rather unimpressed with the mango and remarked that it looked like a normal sweet potato. When the propaganda teams caught wind of his statements, the man was arrested as a counter-revolutionary. He was quickly tried, found guilty, paraded through the village as an example to the masses, and taken to the edge of town where he was executed. This mango fever and the desire to show support for Mao generated a wide array of products that featured mangoes and mango designs. Mango facsimiles made of wax and plastic were extremely popular. So were mango-flavored cigarettes, mango-scented soaps, and all manner of mango print textiles. Mango imagery simply dominated popular culture and was heavily featured in state propaganda resulting in these magnificent posters. Looking at these images through contemporary eyes, they seem outrageously absurd. But there are good reasons for the mango's popularity. The gift of the mangoes signified to the people a radical shift in government policy. It signified an end to the extreme bloodshed and chaos that the Red Guards wrought on the general public. Furthermore, one cannot ignore the coercive undertones of this craze. In the National Day Parade previously mentioned, the Communist Party employed the symbolism of sunflowers facing the sun, with a twist. This imagery was familiar to the public as it was often featured in propaganda posters, sunflowers representing the people and the sun representing Mao. Only in the parade, the sun was replaced with a basket of mangoes, clearly communicating to everyone watching that Mao and the mango were one and the same, in effect siphoning the people's spontaneous enthusiasm for the mango towards Mao. So, showing anything less than absolute reverence and eternal love for the mango was interpreted as an insult directed at the great leader, which is simply not something that anyone dared doing. Those who did paid the ultimate price. About a year and a half after Mao's gift, the mango symbol faded out of Chinese popular culture. It disappeared almost as quickly as it emerged, which may seem strange, but then again, for a brief period of time, the entirety of the human race inexplicably became obsessed with fidget spinners. Remember those? And none of us were even coerced into it. Try explaining that in 50 years and see if it makes any sense. If you'd like to watch more of these documentaries, please consider subscribing to the channel, liking the video, and share it. It'll be a huge help. And consider supporting the channel on Patreon. My laptop almost burnt a hole through my desk while rendering this video. With your support, I could get a better machine. If there is a specific topic you'd like me to cover, please make sure you tell me in the comments. I'll see you soon.